Hi, everyone. Welcome to the fall 2021 YA preview with Candlewick Press and Walker Books US. My name is Stephanie Pando, and I am part of the publicity department at Candlewick. I am really super happy to be here tonight with everybody among our book friends. Tonight, I have two people joining me, uh, Raquel and Jamie, if you want to just pop on and say hi real quick. Hi, I'm Raquel Stetcher, and I'm the Senior Online Marketing Manager at Candlewick. It's nice to have you all here. Hi, I'm Jamie Pan, and I'm a Senior Publicist at Candlewick, and I'm very excited about tonight. I even brought a brownie. We are so excited to be able to give you guys a sneak peek of our newest YA titles for fall, which published between September 2021 and February 2022. And we're very lucky because we not only have one, but three special guests. Uh, our upcoming opening speaker is A.R. Capetta, author of Echo After Echo, The Lost Coast, and their newest Heartbreak Bakery, which we'll hear more about shortly. And we also have Eric Smith and Lauren Gibaldi, Eric <clears throat> editors and authors of the upcoming YA anthology, Battle of the Bands. So make sure you stick around until the end. If you find it useful, feel free to follow along with the Edelweiss catalog, which includes all the titles mentioned tonight. And the link will be dropped into the chat box to the side. You can also request the digital galleys through Edelweiss at any time during the event by clicking on the request button on the right hand side. At the end of the event tonight, there will be a link that will pop up and on your screen to request physical galleys as well. There's also a Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen somewhere over here. Um, so feel free to submit any questions for our authors through the Q&A box, and we'll try to answer as many as possible during both of our Q&A sessions this evening. If you're having technical difficulties, do not worry. We'll be distributing a link to the recording after the preview later, so you will not miss a thing. There will also be an email with all of the links mentioned at tonight's event, including the gallery request form. All right, so now that that's out of the way, let's get started. Before diving in, I have just a quick few housekeeping things to go over. Uh, first, we are on social media. Uh, so don't... Um, so feel free to follow us on Candlewick Press's Twitter, Instagram, YouTube page, and Facebook. Um, you can also use us, um, use, blah. you can also tag us if you're posting during the preview and use hashtag Candlewick YA preview. Uh, we would be really excited to hear what you are um, excited about. Walker Books US is also on Twitter and Instagram. So give them a follow and stay caught up on all the book related content over there. If you want to be able to be up to date on all of our latest YA ebooks and our new releases, subscribe to the Evil monthly newsletter. Did you know that Candlewick Press has a podcast? Candlewick Press Presents is a monthly podcast series that interviews Candlewick authors about their books, craft, writing, and everything in between. Featured YA authors include Meg Medina, M.T. Anderson, Annie Cardi, Kelly Link, and Gavin Grant. You can subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Stitcher, or by going to www.candlewickpodcast.com. We also highly encourage you to turn into our Black Creator Series, which is an educator-focused conversation series that highlights the work of Black authors and illustrators. The series is led by Dr. Sonia Cherry-Paul, who is the Director of Diversity and Equity at the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project at Columbia University. The current YA authors include Fred Joseph, author of The Black Friend, Sophia Thakur, author of Somebody Give This Heart a Pen, and Kekla Magoon, co-author of X, a novel, and one of our upcoming titles this evening, Revolution in Our Time. For the full schedule and more information on how to participate in these powerful conversations, you can go to blackcreatorseries.candlewick.com. We are pleased to highlight our wonderful film adaptations of our books, which has been really exciting to see. From the classic dystopian novel, The Knife of Never Letting Go by Patrick Ness comes Chaos Walking, starring Tom Holland and Daisy Ridley, which is available on Amazon Prime Video. 
Also new on Netflix is Jean Neary's heart-tugging masterpiece on urban black cowboys in Philadelphia called Concrete Cowboy, starring Idris Elba and Stranger Things' Caleb McLaughlin. Coming up this summer, San Diego Comic-Con will continue to host their major annual pop culture event virtually. Normally we would be there exhibiting, unfortunately we are not this year, but you can catch all of our Candlewick-centered programming online, which celebrates the joy of Comic-Con during the dates of the event. This includes our Fall into YA panel, moderated by Maggie Takuda Hall, author of The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea, along with Alexandra Lee Young, author of Idle Gossip, and Claire McFall, author of Ferryman. This panel will premiere on Saturday, July 24th on the Candlewick YouTube page. You can also catch AR Capetta's on SDCC's panel, Cinnamon Rolls, Grumpy Bears, and More Romance Protags, also premiering in July, which I think is a great segue for Jamie to take over introducing our first guest speaker. Cool. Hi. So I am so delighted to introduce you all to author and baker extraordinaire A.R. Capetta, who uses all pronouns. Their latest book, The Heartbreak Bakery, can best be described as a queer rom com with mouth watering baking and a vibrant, introspective soul. An important word of warning to everyone out there, I highly suggest that you make sure you have baked good on hands when you read this, maybe some cookies or a whole cake because you will need them. The Heartbreak Bakery is a book that you will want to bake, pick up for so many reasons. It's a sugar-laced LGBTQ plus mirror, a comfort book and a baking book. It's laugh out loud, it's laugh out loud funny and pensive all at once and it is set in a queer utopia Austin with baked goods and a cast of characters you will easily fall in love with. The book is very, very good. But what's it about? Well, what do you do when a batch of brownies you made after your girlfriend broke up with you accidentally makes everyone who eats them break up? That's the last thing that Sid, um, who requests that you use no pronouns, please, wants to deal with after Sid's now ex-girlfriend clarifies that, no, they broke up. I didn't realize. The effects of the breakup brownies are nothing less than nuclear. The owners of the Proud Muffin, Austin's queer bakery and community space, break up, as do a slew of others. Panicking, Sid enlists the help of the cute trans mask delivery person, Hartley, who uses pronouns he and they. Sid is one of the first agenda protagonists in YA, and AR has created a world representing the wide range of, LGB of the LGBTQ spectrum, along with accurately depicting relationships, both monogamous and polyamorous. The author of Echo After Echo, The Lost Coast, and so many more, AR worked as a professional baker and lived in Austin for a time. They currently teach in the MFA program for writing for children and young adults at Vermont College of Fine Arts and live with their spouse, Corey McCarthy, and their young baker. Without further ado, A.R. Capetta. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you for bringing that brownie because I already feel a little bit bad um, for not <laughs> being able to provide baked goods for everyone tonight. Um, very much a good thing to have on hand if you do get a chance to pick up a book. And I will be talking about baking a little bit tonight. So if you don't have one on hand, I am sorry. Um, <laughs> right. um, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to say to you all tonight because you've gifted me a slice of your time and not just any time, but an early summer Friday, which is a very precious thing. And over the last year, I think we've all come to feel how big a gift that is. Um, sharing our time together is no small magic. I'd also like to wish everybody happy Pride. It's very, very exciting to be here talking about my 10th queer YA novel and also having a much needed month of celebration, rest and reflection, even as our community keeps pushing towards big needed changes. The Heartbreak Bakery is a very much a celebration of that community. Um, and as Jamie mentioned, the bakery itself is called the Proud Muffin. So I think you can sort of get the, the feel of it from there. Um, also, as Jamie mentioned, it's one of the first traditionally published YA novels with an agender main character. And after writing down a few thoughts about agender representation and how this book was a special way to share some of my own gender feelings and journey, I, I sat down to actually write the speech and I spent an entire hour looking at recipes for strawberry rhubarb crumble. <laughs> it might sound like a digression, but go with me. Um, strawberry rhubarb pie is one of my favorite things in the universe. I worked at a bakery they made these miniature ones with the perfect little lattice tops and they were just beautiful but um right now this 
recipe sounds just right to me. Um, it's sweet and tart and bright with lemon flavor. And you just toss the crumble topping right on it because you don't have time for precision when you can go outside and maybe even share a dessert with someone you haven't seen in a year. So, and we had that epic strawberry moon last night. So how that felt like the perfect way to celebrate, right? Oh, so I think that the recipe that starting to come up on the screen as well. So I turned to my spouse, Corey McCarthy, right before this. And I said, I think my gender is the strawberry moon. And they said, yes. So these are the fun kinds of things that we get to talk about. Um, so I feel like Sid, the self-proclaimed agender cupcake, who is the protagonist of the Heartbreak Bakery, would really want you to know about Star uh, the strawberry rhubarb crumble right now and would want you all to have a chance to have one. Um, because it would want everyone to have something seasonal and sweet and tied to the feeling of this moment. Don't get me wrong, Sid would also very much want everyone to care about queer and trans love stories and the existence of agender and gender flux folks, both on the pages of books and in the world. Um, Sid would also be delighted by the new crop of diverse rom-coms lighting up the YA canon and would read all of them with voracious delight, as I'm also having fun doing these days. Sid's story is a YA rom-com with recipes um, and a dash of magic. I wrote it because my very own love interest, who I recently married, um, told me that it was really time for me to sit down and write this story. <laughs> I've been thinking about it for a long time. I got to write about falling in love with a savory sweetheart, who I very much had to win over to baked goods, just like Sid and Harley in the books. Um, and right before this, when we were talking, they said, you literally made me something really sweet when you wrote this book. And I I hadn't thought about it that way, but that was really nice. When I started writing, I also knew I had the perfect editor to work with. Miriam Newman not only understands queer community from the inside, but has sent me homemade revision cookies and gotten at least 12 emails deep with me into threads about frosting and holiday pies. This was before we were working on a baking book together. So I knew that writing this would be a great way for us to get to continue that and also to twist my life as an author together with one of my earliest jobs which was as a baker. And this book also has magic in it. The magic of pouring your feelings into something and sharing it. Anyone who does anything creative knows about this magic. It's not just a fun way to spice up a rom-com, although it is that too. <laughs> it's also a very real way to share who we are with the people around us on our own terms. And at the end of the day, I was really happy to have the chance to write a book with an age under protagonist that includes all of these ingredients, that has the room to hold all of them, right? I didn't feel like I had to narrow everything down to just one in order to teach people something about being age under or to reach them with Sid's story. This felt really important to me back when I started writing this book. It was initially drafted before the pandemic became an everyday part of our lives. My thinking started to tilt in new directions as I revised and recipe tested over the course of the last year, often waiting for weeks for ingredients to show back up on the shelf. I wondered what it meant to be writing a book based on in-person community when that had been taken away from all of us. I thought about writing about an abundance of, of food and sweetness and love in a time when good things could feel very, very scarce. And I wondered if the magic in the story was what anybody truly needed right now. And then I saw something happening all over my social media feeds, all over the country and the world. People were baking. <laughs> they were baking so much that King Arthur flour, which is nearby me up in Vermont, literally could not make flour fast enough. They had set up a phone line that fielded hundreds and hundreds of calls a day, mostly from brand new bakers. In my community, friends and neighbors, and even a local bakery helped people find and exchange ingredients they needed. Um, I talked with an author and baker friend of mine um, about how much we needed baking as an emotional outlet on top of writing, and not just for the, all the shiny feelings, we need it for rage baking too, it's a very real thing. And then there's the baking that feels like one of the simplest expressions of love, and I think that people really turned to that too. Um, when my spouse and I hit the one year anniversary of our wedding, we were in quarantine and also in the middle of some very serious medical news. And the best celebration we could imagine was still a three-day bake-a-thon to recreate these flaky chocolate cornetti, which they're, they're like croissants, but they're the Italian version, which we fell in love with when Corey and I went to Italy back in 2019. And in that moment, we really needed to reconnect with that time and that place and that feeling, that joy. 
And when I tested the final recipe you'll find in Heartbreak Bakery, page under cupcakes, I was not able to share them in person with my queer chosen family, but I absolutely, absolutely did a cupcake drop on, on porches all over the place. So they still made them, to, they still made it to people. People were connecting with each other, even when we couldn't share kitchens or sit down at tables together. We were looking for sustenance, we were forging community, we were creating new traditions and we were searching for joy. All of this feels deeply important to me. I think people are starting to rightly question what we mean when we say a book about queer and trans characters is important. I know I'm not the only person hoping that that concept can start to grow a little bit because the truth is it's all important. Queer people have always known that community is survival, that safe spaces we find online and in person and through art and shared passions can change our lives, that our love is resistance and the growth of possibility. I hope the Heartbreak Bakery brings you moments of connection and joy, like sharing something just baked out of the oven. I hope that you read it if you connect with the identities in the story, and I hope you read it if you don't, because we all need to learn to show up for each other's joy. And as something to tide you over before the book is officially out, I wanted to share the gift that Sid, I think, would have insisted on, because Sid is a very insistent sort of person. <laughs> so I, I have this recipe. I tested it over the weekend. I brought it to friends who literally just moved up to Vermont, and I got to sit down with them at a housewarming, and, and we got to have this together. So this is the strawberry rhubarb crumble that I mentioned <laughs> that I couldn't stop looking up recipes uh, and, and trying to configure my own version, because that's sort of what I do. Um, I hope you get a chance to bake and read and do lots of delicious things this year. Finding moments of sustenance and sweetness as we work toward change. Thank you so much for talking with me tonight. Oh, and there's a picture of how it turned out. See, crumbles are a joyful mess. They're, you, they're very fun. Just throw them together. August, or AR, thank you so much for that. Um, I have to admit, I did take my first bite of brownie right before you ended and I was like, oh no, <laughs> but I'm pretending I am enjoying, mm. I am enjoying your baked good um, instead of this brownie. But um, okay, so okay. let's kick off the Q&A. Are you ready? Yes. I'm Okay, so I am going to shove myself to the beginning of the line because I have a question I've been wanting oh. to ask you this entire time, which yeah. is, did you snap on anything in particular during the making of this book? Oh, um, <laughs> yes, but I'm trying to narrow it down. Um, <laughs> let's see, I made a lot of scones. There were a lot of, <laughs> there were a lot of scones um, because that's sort of my go-to weekend throw together and because my nine-year-old and I make them together. So, and I also discovered the, the technique of grating cold butter um, for, for scones and biscuits this year. And it just makes them so much faster. Lots of scones. <laughs> that sounds delicious. <laughs> um, my, our next question um, is, tell us about a food experience that you think really was magical. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, food experience that really was magical. Um, <laughs> Let me think about that. All right, so the first one that comes to mind, I have to, so so with, with Corey, um, I asked, so the first, the first birthday we ever spent, um, so Corey's first birthday that we were together as a couple, um, I asked them what kind of cake, but no, I didn't ask them what kind of cake they wanted. I thought I was being very sneaky about it. So a few weeks beforehand, I asked, um, what's your favorite flavor? Just like I, I worked it into a conversation. Like I was very subtle. I was just like, you know, I, I, I built it in and they took this really long pause and went Turkey. <laughs> it's like, no, no, I'm sorry. I can't do anything with that answer. I cannot do Turkey. And so I had to blow it at that point and be like, no, this is, this is about, this is about sweet things. And, and he was like, sweet things. Okay. Maybe. Lemons. So I made a cake that has eight actual full lemons, like squeezed into it. Cause I was like, this is not a person who loves sweet. So we're going to go all the way. And then, and then, um, I feel like the way that the actual cake turned out, it was just like this 
beautiful. It was, it was nothing like I've ever made before. <laughs> and I, and um, we had like this magical night together. And so that's, but it really could have ended in disaster because Turkey. <laughs> I, that came out of left field, but that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. It's a beautiful, precious memory. That's all right. I got. Oh my gosh. Um, so we have an audience question from Lily. Um, if you had to characterize your past books as tasty treats, what would they be? Ooh, that's a fun question. Um, okay, where do I start? Okay, the um, the Brilliant Death and the Storm of Life are Italian fantasy novels. So those are definitely, um, those, are, those have to be Italian baked goods. Um, probably, I was just talking about Cornetti, so they're in my head. Um, <laughs> but but something very um, something very delicious like that, or or the my family always makes the almond cookies um, at at the holidays, like those very rich, like they're like they're just ground nuts and sugar, and they're dusted with more sugar. I think that's what they would be, really. Um, Opulent, but, yeah, yes. Um, and then the um let's see the lost coast oh the lost coast would be something so those so that's a california book and i feel like that would be something kind of like airy and and magically light like a like um something probably like a peach um like milfoy type i'm doing a whole thing over here this is I'm getting sorry, too elaborate this all sounds delicious. i'm gonna continue okay. eating this brownie <laughs> tell me more about food. okay and then um, echo after echo, uh, New York love story, like just, just like chocolate and rich and like a, probably like a chocolate vodka, <laughs> like just a huge, just like, like a, like the whole loaf, um, is that story. So that's a couple of them I could keep going, but I will continue to think about this by the way, until I figured out all of them. <laughs> and pop back in with more of them too, if you I think will, about yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so our next question um, we have is, in writing across um, genres, what themes do you find yourself coming back to? And do you feel any of those themes made it to, um, made it into Heartbreak Bakery? Yeah, um, I am very much um, always coming back to found family. Um, it, it snuck its way into my writing at first, and then I realized that it was sort of my my jam <laughs> and and so it, it's always always there and um this is an interesting one because it actually has a little bit more of Sid's um Sid's birth family in there and sort of like the the balance of the people that you choose in your in your life and 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 finding um the ways that you also continue to grow with and get to know the people that you've lived with your whole life. Um, so that was an interesting balance and that felt a little bit different than some of the ones that I've done that are just like, you live in space and you've been thrown together with a bunch of strangers. Will you become found family? Spoiler alert, you probably will. I love that theme. It makes it so much fun to read your book. Ooh, okay, we have another audience question. Um, so this is from Allison Russell. Um, tell us a baking tip that might also relate to relationships that most people don't know or don't follow. Oh, okay. I have one. Ooh, okay. <laughs> I feel like this is the opposite of what everyone. I, I when I told when I told people I was a baker for years when I was this my actual job, people would say, "Oh, I, I can't, I can't bake." it's too, it's, it's too meticulous and it's too, I have to follow the recipe perfectly step-by-step step and I have to do everything exact, but they thought, they think that's what baking is. Someone has, people have been very good at, at purveying this idea that, that baking is this very precise thing. I don't bake like that at all. I actually would recommend <laughs> that you look at recipes and figure out what you like and figure out the way that the ratios work in certain sorts of recipes in, in, in you know, rich cookies or in a scone or in whatever you like to bake and then do it your own way. <laughs> I, I would very much suggest going off road, off recipe. And I feel like that is my relationship advice is to not, um, it's, it's to figure out what works for you. 
and not worry about those recipes are what works have worked for other people in their specific kitchens and their specific preferences and they're trying to give you like okay this worked for me it might work for you but you're probably going to have to tinker it and if you look at any recipe online even really successful ones there's a thousand comments that say it was great but i did this and this and i tweaked it a little bit this way and that was also great so do it your own way <laughs> Oh man. Okay. I am not a great baker. I think for the same reasons you outlined and I really appreciate that advice. So thank you. Oh, also make a mess. I don't worry. Don't worry oh, about yeah. that. Make a mess. Flour everywhere. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have one question left. Um, and I'm taking this from Bridget um, Raimundo who loved the surge of bakers last year. And what were some of the new things you learned as an author while working on this book within the past year? Yeah, um, the new things I learned as an author about um, by working on this book over the past year, I think that I learned um, that it's okay to really focus on bright and joyful things when you need them. Um, I was focusing on bright and joyful things in a time where it felt easy and fun at first. And I felt like, um, that was something that I was drawn to and I was excited about and, and it was a delightful north sort of next step and then all of a sudden it was sort of thrown into this um inversion where life was very very hard and um and and there were things that were being thrown um and at everyone and then and and, and then our, our our family with these and um medical things and and so I, it was just this ability to go back to these simple things that bring you joy um, as a writer and as a creative person and knowing that those things don't stop having meaning they actually have more they 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 feed you in a way that you need to keep being fed even in times when things are really really hard so in some ways i'm really glad this is the book that i was working on it was very much a gift and a joy <laughs> so yeah thank you for that thanks for those questions those are great <laughs> Well, again, AR, thank you again for spending this time with us on this Friday night. And I am, oh, I had a very, my segue, hold on. Um, and everyone, I encourage you all to either go make or buy some baked goods as soon as possible. And now we're going to head over to the rest of the presentation. And Stephanie, I am passing you the spatula. Hi again. Uh, I am pleased to introduce the first in a paranormal YA trilogy from our Walker Books US division, available on October 12th, Ferryman, based on Greek mythology, comes from internationally acclaimed author Claire McFall. It's fast paced and romantic and thrilling all in one go, but I will have Claire talk a bit more about it instead. My name is Claire McFall, and I am the author of the Fairman Trilogy. By Candlewick Press, and I am here to talk to you today about the first book in the trilogy, which is just called Fairman. There it is. Oh, happiness is a beautiful color. <laughs> so, what is the book about? Uh, the main character is a girl called Dylan and she is a 14 year old girl who lives in Scotland and she lives with her mother Joan um, but they don't really get on too well and she feels a bit of an outsider at school so she's looking for a way to kind of find herself a bit and she wants to reconnect with her dad. Um, after much negotiation slash argument she uh, is allowed to go on a weekend trip to go and meet him for the first time and she's getting the train up to the north of Scotland but about halfway there, the train goes into a tunnel and does not come back again. There is an enormous crash, and when Dylan wakes up, she is just surrounded by detritus, and it's all really dark, and the train had been really crowded, and there's nobody else there. So she's thinking, they've forgotten me, I've been unconscious and I've been missed, manages to claw her way out of the train, out of the tunnel, and she's expecting to see paramedics, firemen, people, and all those aluminium tinfoil blankets looking really traumatized, and said there's nobody except for one person, one boy, and his name is Tristan. And he claims to her that he was on the train too. They've just come out the wrong side, but don't worry, trust him. He can get her to a safe place and he, maybe she can salvage some of her weekend. 
that is a big fat lie. He is not a real boy. He was not on the train. In actual fact, he is her ferry man. And the reason that she woke up alone is because she was the only person who did not survive the crash. And his job now is to get her across the wasteland, which is full of terrifying wraith demon creatures, and get her to the Aptor. The um, book is actually a retelling of the Greek myth of Charon, who was the ferryman of Hades, who ruled the underworld, and his job was to take souls across the river Styx and the rivers Asheron, which were the rivers of misery and pain, so you didn't really want to swim, and, uh, and he would take them to live in the shadow of Mount Olympus. And you maybe have heard of when people die, they would sometimes put pennies over their eyes, and that was so that you had the money to pay the ferryman, because if you couldn't pay, then your soul had to wander up and down the shore for the rest of eternity, lost and alone. Uh, I got the idea for the story through a dream, which I find a bit cringy to confess, but I did. I had a dream that I was on a train, it had been really crowded, and then all of a sudden it was just me on my own. And I was thinking about this while I was driving to work. Um, it's quite a long commute and it was just me and some sheep, the occasional tractor, and so I was just mulling over and it occurred to me, if I'm the only person left, something probably went wrong, probably happened to me, and I probably died. I don't know what that says about my subconscious, but that's where I went. And, uh, and then it was just a really short leap from there to the idea of the ferryman and I hadn't heard the story retold in a modern way and the pieces just kind of kept building and snowballing until I had this idea. And I got a few lines stuck in my head, which is actually now the beginning to chapter three. Uh, and it wouldn't go away until I wrote it down. And then I wrote a little bit more and a little bit more and then all of a sudden I had the story. And um, yeah, now I'm giving it to you. I really hope you like it. <laughs> Thank you for listening and bye-bye. Hey everyone, I'm here to present The Delusionist by Don Calame. And anyone who knows me knows I am a Don Calame um, super fan. I love his books. The Swim the Fly trilogy, I've read four times. So I'd say I'm a huge fan. So with The Delusionist, um, it, it focuses on this character, Quinn. He's 15 years old and he loves magic. And he's part of this magic duo with his best friend, Perry, who is the popular kid at their high school. And they really want to enter this um, um, co magic competition to be able to um, be part of this magic fantasy camp, but they have to do it individually. They can't do it as a duo. So Quinn has to find his um, own magic style and his own way to present without his best friend. And along the way, he meets two really interesting figures. He meets um, Danny, who's this mysterious, um, beautiful, um, and um, um, new girl at their high school who he has a complete crush on and she's really good at magic and her magic style goes beyond the just the sleight of hand so there's her and she's also their competition um, and then he meets Bob who's this older former professional music um, magician who um, became a scam artist and he's sort of like this really oddball um, mentor for him and Don Calame's books like they have a lot of wit and humor and this one is no exception it's really light read there's lots of really quirky characters it has a lot of heart and it's just very charming so this The Delusionist by Don Calame comes out October don't sleep on it make sure you check it out What happens when you drop a Chinese American girl into the glamorous and highly regimented world of K-pop? Well, it's a bit like a bull rampaging around a China shop. And author Alexandra Lee Young writes a fun tale of K-pop, fame, culture clashes, and connections. Um, Idol Gossip is Alex's debut novel. And for her day job, she's at the New York Times The Daily Podcast. Here, she shares the inspiration behind Idol Gossip. 
Unmatched by Candlewick Press. I'm really excited to present you my debut YA novel, Idle Gossip, today because it's set in a world that I've spent several years in and that is, of course, the world of K-pop. I can honestly split my life into two distinct halves, the time before K-pop and the time after K-pop. And it all started in 2014 when I moved to South Korea from New York City and I went there to report on the music industry there. I was instantly hooked by the sound of K-pop, but one day my friend told me that, that I could actually go see idols in the flesh if I went to the show called M Countdown. So I went there and I stood in line with hundreds of other fans. And as I was standing there, a, a van with tinted windows rolled up and out popped the members of Teen Top in their matching black suits. And to my utter surprise, the fans around me, they didn't scream, they didn't rush them. Uh, they just went up to them respectfully and everybody kind of hung out together. And it was very low key and very, very cool to see everybody up close and personal. After Teen Top left, I stuck around and got to interview some of their fandom. And I'll never forget this one girl. She was still in her high school uniform. She had the loafers and the knee highs and the, the blazer and the button up, short black bangs. And we struggled to talk a little bit in my broken Korean. But what she explained to me is that loving K-pop isn't about, you know, idol worship. It's, it's a two-way street. Fans support their idols and idols support their fans. And they both understand that, you know, one wouldn't exist without the other. My book, Idol Gossip, is about a Chinese American girl with K-pop dreams, but it's also about fitting in and standing out. It's about owning your privilege. It's about being an outsider, but it's also about the idol fanship relationship. And I think K-pop fans really get a bad rap for being these kind of crazed, obsessed fans. But what I've learned over the years is that K-pop is about so much more than that. It's about family, it's about dreams, and it's about the power of a group united under one cause. And that's really what I set out to capture in my book. Thanks so much for listening. Great, and so our next title, and we're gonna have a slide up here in just a second, um, is for Tekla Magoon's Revolution in Our Time, um, which is coming out September 28th, 2021. Um, Revolution in Our Time, the Black Panther Party's Promise to the People is the definitive book about the Black Panther Party for the teen set. Tekla is a Margaret A. Edwards Award winner, a Coretta Scott King Honor winner, and has received a slew of awards for her work. There's no one better suited to write this book than Kekla. The events that are in this book are both powerful and utterly maddening. Um, the creation of the Black Panther Party came from a desire to defend and protect the Black community. Their image has, and their image has been sensationalized to focus on guns and perceived threats, ignoring the purposeful takedown of the party and infiltration of the party by outside forces. Um, but the reality of the Black Panther Party in its heyday is deeper. Um, did you know that the median age of the Black Panthers was 19, as the average Black Panther member was 19, and the majority of the membership included women? There was also an intense focus on survival programs, as they really wanted to alleviate people suffering immediately. This involved free breakfast at school, food and clothing drives, medical clinics, community patrols, boycotts, and also mutual aid funds. Um, one Black Panther activity, which I just think is just really it says a lot about them, um, involved accompanying seniors as they cashed their pension checks to make sure that they weren't robbed back on the way to their homes. This entire list sounds too, too familiar. These are activities that continue today because the injustices that plague the Black Panther Party and the Black community as a whole continue to exist unabated. This book is essential reading to understand Black and American history, and this book belongs on your TBR. Next up is Fat Angie Homecoming by E.E. E. Charlton Trujillo. The final installment for the, to the Fat Angie trilogy, Fat Angie Homecoming follows Angie after her road trip to perform in Columbus. She finally feels like she's figuring things out and is ready to take the next step with Jamboree to be her girlfriend. That's of course until her first love, Casey, returns to town. 
As if that isn't messing with Angie's emotions enough, Angie's Columbus performance goes viral and everyone gets even more confusing. Kids at school are treating her with respect. She's being recognized in public and her couldn't be bothered mother is, well, bothered is an understatement. <laughs> Grappling with internet fame, two people tugging at Angie's heart, managing an all girl band and moving through her flawed family life, Angie works through getting it together before she loses her sense of self again. That Angie Homecoming is available on November 2nd, 2021. And if you're interested in Fat Angie Homecoming, but haven't read the other two books, have no fear. The Stonewall Award-winning first novel, Fat Angie, is available in paperback, and the sequel, Fat Angie Homecoming, Rebel Girl Revolution, will be available in paperback in October, 2021. Hey, I'm here to talk about the fall 2021 paperbacks. First, we have the wintry psychological thriller by Tim Wynn Jones, The Starlight Claim, which comes out this October. And then we have a collection of coming of age poems by renowned performance poet, Sophia Thakur, Somebody Give This Heart a Pen, which comes out in September. And we just heard from A.R. Capetta and her um, theatrical mystery slash love story, Echo After Echo, comes out in paperback this September. In case you missed it, we have great books you can catch up on before our Fall 21 titles hit bookstores near you. For fans of E. Lockhart's We Were Liars, The Great Godden by Meg Rossoff follows one summer where teenage sons of a fading movie star drum up drama in this dreamy vacation spot by the sea. If you're missing conventions, like me, Zoe Rosenthal is not lawful good by Nancy Whirlin will fill that hole in your heart. The main character Zoe struggles to balance her perfectly buttoned up life between giving into her true self, which is the con going, cosplay wearing, hyper fan, uber stan that she is. Also up is All Our Hidden Gifts by Carolyn O'Donoghue. And it is the strange and spooky summer read, if I do say so myself. It follows teen troublemaker Maeve, who gains popularity by becoming her school's tarot reader until her former best friend goes missing after a reading. NPR says All Our Hidden Gifts takes friendship seriously and treats its queer and diverse characters with empathy and respect, all while frolicking off on some baddie supernatural adventure. But Caroline describes it best. If you're into tarot, poking around in weird shops, uh, overthrowing the white Christian patriarchal government um, and worldview with spells and a romantic lead that would give Timothy Chalamet a run for his money, then this is the book for you. And finally, um, set in the 90s with a throwback to those extinct blockbusters that I do miss, <laughs> comes Baby and Solo by Elizabeth Posthuma. Joel, soon to be rechristened Han Solo, and eventually Solo, looks for his new job, looks at his new job at Royal Video as a tabula rasa. No one knows anything about him or the troubles he's had in the past. He starts making friends, including Baby, who also has her own secrets like Joel. This is a coming of age novel that is as painful as it is powerful with each character undergoing dramatic change and coming out with a completely under new understanding of themselves and the world around them. And this now brings me to our final closing um, book for the evening and our speakers. Battle of the Bands, edited by Lauren Gibaldi and Eric Smith. This is a true passion project for the 16 contributors, one of whom is a real life rock star, Justin Courtney Pierre, who is the lead vocalist of the pop punk band Motion City Soundtrack. Not only that, but the stories in this anthology are penned by a powerhouse of New York Times bestselling authors, including Brittany Cavallaro, Preeti Chiver, Jay Coles, Katie Cotugno, Lauren Gibaldi, Sean David Hutchinson, Ashley Poston, Jenny Torres Sanchez, Sarah Nicole Samantana, Eric Smith, Jen Marie Thorne, Sarvanaz Tagavian, Jasmine Warga, Ashley Woodfolk, and Jeff Sentner. Okay. These YA authors band together to create dynamic interconnected stories centering around one of high school's most epic events and memorable rites of passage, the Battle of the Bands competition. This book is taking the stage on September 7th, 2021. I could honestly go on about this anthology for the rest of the evening, but I'm going to yield my time over to our speakers themselves, Eric and Lauren. Mm. 
There we go. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here today. It means so much to us that we get to talk to you about our little anthology. Yes, we threw a lot of our, our musical hearts into this project, uh, and I hope you love it as much as we do. Like, I, Lauren, I know you were like listening to Blink-182 to get hyped for today. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> so with Battle of the Bands, we wanted to capture this key experience that is in the lives of teens. There are so many of those moments growing up from prom, homecoming, high school musical. That, that idea was taken, though, so we, we couldn't really do that one. Unfortunately. But for us, for Eric and I, Battle of the Bands was, was really, really huge. And we hope a lot of teens who pick up this book will see the same struggles and celebrations and joys and battles that happen not just on the stage, but behind the scenes. Because music, at least to us, in a lot of ways is kind of like life. With, uh, with Battle of the Bands, it was an anthology I had a while ago. Um, I just thought it was kind of a neat idea. I was a theater kid who loved going to pop punk shows here in Orlando, Florida, where I am right now. Hi from Orlando. Um, so I went to a lot of these shows on the weekends. I was also the drummer of an all-girl, really not good uh, band that had one whole gig, and that was our high school's Battle of the Bands. Um, high five to Candid Apple. Um, so to me, the performing arts and everything that it entailed was such a huge key part of my teen years. Oh yeah, and it was really the same for me. I, I, I played in high school band. Uh, I played in terrible high school garage bands. Uh, I played in ska bands for a while because uh, I, I'm in my late 30s. This was the late 90s. That's just what you did um, in college. Uh, I ended up going on tour with some fairly popular pop punk bands and emo groups as a photographer. Uh, and that really just cemented myself pretty firmly uh, in this world uh, for life. I think Eric and I first kind of bonded over our love of 90s ska music and punk music, and that's kind of how we became friends, um, which kind of worked its way into this book. So when we were at the Louisiana Book Festival several years ago, I brought up this idea to Eric at like 2 a.m. at an airport when we were both waiting for our flights home. And we just talked about it a lot and agreed to work on it together. And that's kind of how our book was born. Yeah. You know, we reached out to authors who love music, often wrote about music. Uh, in some cases, they, they played music. And, you know, and I think when, when we were at that airport that day, Katie Katunga was like sitting right next to us. You know, she was one of the, the many people that would end up in the book. <laughs> yeah, she didn't know that at the time, that we were planning her future with us. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so we also... Uh, not so we, we kind of forced our, our authors to give us photos of themselves in high school because we're nice like that. So we have some photos. We have uh, teen Jen Marie Thorne at the top left. We have Justin Courtney Pierre, Jeff Zentner, and then Sarah Nicole Smetana in their youth playing music and recording and looking really cool. <sighs> And okay, so we're gonna, because we are our 90s fans, we're gonna use one of our favorite classic music video hooks. So I wanna give some kind of fun facts about the contributors of Battle of the Bands because they're all super duper awesome. And Eric, I need you to help me out with this. Can you make like the bloop noise for each whenever I give out a fact? Uh, I don't know if I wanna do that. Um, You're going to. So first we have Jeff Sentner. Um, Jeff Sentner, go ahead. Oh, bloop. <laughs> yeah, thank you, do that bloop. Um, did you know Jeff Zentner? We've got bottom left-hand corner. Um, he's the author of The Serpent King and other really amazing books. He used to play music with people like Nick Cave and Iggy Pop. And then, of course, Justin Courtney Pierre. Yeah. Oh. Eric. Uh, boop. <laughs> Thank you. Is the singer of Motion City Soundtrack, a fantastic band that's toured the world. And it's incredible that he's he wanted to do this book with us. It's really good. Um, he recorded with the singer of Blink-182, who I was listening to earlier because I am still 17 at heart, um, and got a platinum song for all that. Um, so a lot of the people in this book have strong ties to music, which is why we kind of asked a lot of them to do it with us, whether they grew up just loving it or, you know, attempted to play it in really awful ska bands like Eric. Well, I, where, where did you get that picture even? <laughs> Thank you. But not everyone is a musician. <laughs> so we wanted to show the different elements of, of kind of this musical scene. And so we also have, you didn't have to be in a battle of the bands to be obsessed with music or be part of the scene. 
Absolutely, and I, I can't believe you showed the Scavan picture. Uh, so right here, you could see uh, teen Sean David Hutchinson with his bleach blonde hair, so uh, Woodfolk, Pretty Chipper, Brittany Cavallaro, all ready to hit punk rock concerts as uh, as angsty punk rock teens that we were. <laughs> we were all there. We were so cool. And we wanted to showcase this kind of love of music from this era of our lives that still influences, influences us now. I literally still listen to the music because I'm cool. Um, because teenagers are so teenagers are so often shaped by what they love. And as we all know, teens really love hard. They know what they love. They love it. And they carry these passions with them throughout their lives in big and little ways. And whether they were on the stage or behind the stage or selling tickets or, you know, in the audience, the experience of music and concerts is just so powerful. And we were hope, our biggest hope with this book, it was to kind of get that feeling across that we all love. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now let's, um, I don't know, let's talk about some of the stories uh, that are in here. Um, some of those hit singles that I hope you all enjoy. Uh, as Lauren said, the collection here, we try to showcase the, the vast experience uh, around this fun time. Uh, Pretty Chipper, uh, who many of you might know from her work writing Marvel and Star Wars books, uh, wrote about a merch kid stuck behind the table while a sibling plays on stage uh, and maybe develops a little crush on a fellow merch kid sitting next to them. Um, it's a story about just like desperately wanting to fit in. Uh, the title of it is Merch To Do About Nothing. It's so good, it's so good. <laughs> I will always be jealous of that, that story title. Um, <laughs> uh, Sean David Hutchinson's story introduces us to uh, one of the judges in the audience who happens to be a teenager and has a very difficult choice to make uh, as he's dating a girl in one band and a boy in another band. So there's a lot of drama there. Uh, Jay Coles, uh, his uh, digs into a broken friendship and a complicated relationship. Jenny Torres's, uh, what, what does she talk about? Oh, it's a, a kid who's desperately trying to save their sister from a toxic relationship. We leave the concerts. Uh, there, there's just so much tense stuff going on. And then at the same time, we also wanted to capture the feeling of playing music. And what you're actually looking at on the screen is Candlewick, Candlewick made us this really cool opening page for the book. And it's a poster that shows all of the, the fake bands that we created. So you can kind of see um, all of their, their names and stuff. But we have all of their stories as well. We wanted to share that feeling of being on stage in the spotlight and how music can like literally be everything to, to someone. So Sarah Nicole Smetana's is about doing everything you can to keep your band together, knowing that high school is about to end and how, you know, you can continue even when you're moving apart. Um, Brittany Caval Cavalleros is about a drummer who uh, kind of has a falling out with her sister. So while she's trying to win her sister back, she finds herself in four of the bands competing in Battle of the Bands. And then uh, Jasmine Wargas introduces you, introduces you to this singer songwriter who's tired of being just the songwriter behind her boyfriend's band and wants her chance at the spotlight as well. Yes, there's just, there's just a lot of joy and a lot of sadness and a lot of just a lot of fun, uh, all surrounded by by music. And just like this one. And that's what we wanted for our anthology to kind of set it apart and make it really special. All of the stories we mentioned and everything that happens is just is, is all connected. It's one battle of the band. So you can see little blips and characters from each of the stories and each of the other stories. Um, we made it all flow and interweave together so you can see the entire night. And the authors were incredibly amazing in helping us create this kind of shared experience. They let us kind of move their characters around and have them appear in different things. So you get the entire night of the Battle of the Bands from like the beginning nerves and the setups to cleaning up after the winner is announced. And the there is a winner and the author doesn't know uh, that they won. The, the actual <laughs> author who wrote the story, we have not told them that their band won. So I'm excited for them to find that out. Um, so you get to see it through all of these eyes because we thought every experience uh, is really important for the night for, for them. Yeah, and we hope a lot of team leaders see themselves in the pages and just enjoy the music filled ride. Uh, we definitely did as kids. Uh, and as you could see, we, uh, yeah, we definitely haven't let go of it because here we are with this book. <laughs> <laughs> And that's uh that's about all the bands. <laughs> uh, we'd love to answer some questions and, and and talk to you a little bit more about it. We're uh, yeah. we're excited about this book and and we hope you like it too.
Thank you. That was amazing. Um, I'm so excited to ask you guys questions because I have a ton and we have a couple coming in from our Q&A. So, um, and you, um, the first one, honestly, that I would love to ask you guys, and you, you kind of touched on it a little bit, was you're working with a ton of authors on an anthology. Um, usually anthologies are, are thematic. There's, you know, rom there's romance or it's a, you know, um, all takes place by the sea, but this takes place over one night and one event. And I was just kind of wondering what were some of like the important beats or the important notes that happened in the event that you wanted to make sure all your authors touched on? We, um, well, I think an important thing we started in the beginning was uh, we came up with the school name, where it was located and all of that. And then we just wanted to make sure that we covered the gamut of experiences, I guess. And we never really, we never asked anyone to write anything. They all had ideas and it all kind of worked together right Eric <laughs> yeah yeah we like threw out different uh different concepts that we might have wanted to touch on like oh you know it'd be cool if someone was taking tickets or you know it'd be great if someone was doing merch uh and as we were throwing out the different ideas and people were presenting their stories you know we would share them with everybody mm -hmm. uh people kind of figured out where they wanted to put each other's uh little blips and each other's appearances it was it was very fun like everybody it felt like everyone was just playing in the sandbox with us, you know? <laughs> and it was really cool when like, uh, like Brittany, for instance, decided that her drummer would be in four bands. And so she's like, I don't just put them in bands. And then other people would be like, okay, I have the, the guitarist and it's my main character. So you can put other people as the other band members. So it was a lot, everyone was really easy to work with to kind of make it all weave together. It was really awesome. Yeah. And some people talk to one another uh, mm -hmm. outside of us, you know, Jeff Sentner, uh, and Brittany Cavallaro, uh, their stories bookend the collection yeah. in a really neat way. Uh, and the two of them were in communication while they were writing their stories. And it was a, it was a really awesome surprise. Huh. Mm -hmm. And then me and Jenny Torres Sanchez, she's here in Orlando as well. So we were able to do our stories where her, where hers ends, mine's picks up. That is awesome. I love that is like the best part of this anthology is how interconnected they are, the book ending and all of that. Um, you spoke about like kind of like surprises and I was just kind of wondering what are some of the surprises that whether it was building the anthology together or just the stories themselves like when you worked with all the authors what was something that was surprising that you were excited about or like didn't think about um and it came to during this process I mean I I feel like I you know like like the first one is I didn't expect to cry so much, you know, like. <laughs> well, you uh, cried a lot of things, but. <laughs> I, do, I do cry a lot of things, um, but like, I, I was really surprised that some of the authors like just went full in with some of the, mm -hmm. the, the you know, slightly sadder stories that, that mm -hmm. you know, there's still lots of joy in this because it's about the bands, um, but you know, that there are breakups happening, there are friendships that are feeling a little bit messy. Uh, you know, there, there were some heartstrings tugged at quite a bit. Um, and the other was was getting Justin in the collection yeah. from the soundtrack. I, uh, I, I and I, I tell all my friends this all the time. Just like just shoot your shot when it comes to trying to talk to people who you think are really cool and might not be interested in what you're interested in. Because I I shot him a Facebook message. <laughs> hey, big fan, got this anthology. What do you think? And it, it turned out to be amazing and wonderful. And like, yeah, it, it was an awesome experience getting to work with him. He's the nicest guy. You kind of like, I was like, okay, you know, he'll write a story, send it to us. And that's, that's good. But he's been like, how can I help publicize this? What yeah. can I do? Can I do? And we're like, you are the nicest person. He's been <laughs> phenomenal to work with. And so is like literally all of the authors. I think surprising for me is that like everyone had their own wonderful individual stories and everyone was really cool about us being like, hey, can we just throw this in here or Pretty's I think I felt bad I think for Pretty specifically because hers um has an outline because as a merch person she kind of does like okay this man's going this band's going and we had to make it chronological so like several times I had to email her and be like okay so they're not watching this band anymore they're they're watching a different band that's a complete different style I'm very sorry can you change that <laughs> because as we edited it together we had to change the the set list <laughs> It was a very working draft to, to put it all together, but it was a lot of fun. That's awesome, actually. Um, speaking of just different genres and different kind of music, we actually had a bunch of questions asking if there's going to be a playlist of some kind for the book. <laughs> um, have you thought about doing that or putting something together? 
We, do that. <laughs> we want to. <laughs> I'm not musical. I played it. I played the drums, but um, I haven't since high school, so I can't do anything. But um, there are lyrics in it. There are several. Like Jen Marie Thorne has lyrics in hers. Jay Cole's has lyrics in his. Um, Justin's a musician. Jeff's a musician. So we'd love to one day. <laughs> Um, another question that I have here is you've talked about all the different styles and the different voices and everybody having their own moment. And how did you go about trying to give them that style that worked across the anthology? So everything felt together, but then also giving their own individual space to just like shine. That's a good question. That's a really good question. <laughs> I, I... I feel like we just let everyone do whatever they wanted, you know? And I feel like that's like a bad answer, like craft wise, you know? Like, I feel like I'm supposed to have something a little more interesting to say there, but like we kind of, they, people gave us their pitches for what their story idea was gonna be. And we kind of just let them go with it. it they, we didn't like set a whole, like it needs to be this tone or anything. It just ended up magically working together. And I think in creating like the order of them, we were, you know, we didn't want two sad ones together. So we paced, but honestly, everyone did awesome. And we just. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the last question that I have for tonight is just what is in the future for both of you? Uh, any more anthologies, any more books coming out, just anything to, to plug here on top of Battle of the Vans? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I have a book coming out in, in November called You Can Go Your Own Way, which is a, a music-filled pinball arcade rom-com. Um, and maybe there's another anthology coming. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you guys so much uh, for this wonderful conversation and talking about Battle of the Bands. We're delighted to be able to share this with everybody come September 7th, so make sure you check it out. Thank and you. This, welcome. Yes, ba there's Battle of the Bands. <laughs> oh my gosh. Love the cover. It's so good. We do too. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of where we're going to quickly, hopefully wrap up the previews. So um, this concludes the fall 2021 YA preview. We hope everyone enjoyed it as much as we did. Don't forget that the video will be available to all the attendees after the event, so you can watch it again and again. And again, I no judgment if you want to, I would. Um, and don't forget to request your physical or digital galleys. Um, a link should, oh, fingers crossed, pop up on your browser after you log off. And if not, there will be a, an email that goes out to everyone, which includes all the links mentioned tonight. We're looking forward to the days when we can see everybody in person again. And until then, I hope we can all continue to connect virtually. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe and goodbye and good evening.